This is Dr. Robert Watkins, orthopedic spine surgeon to professional athletes and creator of the Back Doctor app. Today's podcast is on cervical stenosis surgery. So first we'll define what cervical stenosis is, how do you know when you have it, and what are the signs and symptoms, and then we'll talk about what are the risks of having surgery versus not having surgery, and then we'll talk about the different types of surgery that you can have. So first of all, cervical stenosis. Stenosis means constriction or restriction of your spinal canal. So typically with arthritis, degeneration, wear and tear, the disc and the joints crowd in and start to crowd the spinal cord, which can cause compression of the spinal cord and a lack of function of your spinal cord. So how do you know if you have it? First thing is people tend to notice a loss of their balance. So you walk with a broad base gait, which means you can't do a heel to toe walk. Like when the policemen make people walk heel to toe in a straight line, you can't do that. You have a staggering gait where you want to keep your feet wide apart equal to your shoulders to have a good sense of balance. So that's called a myelopathic gait. Myelopathy means dysfunction of the white matter, which is your spinal cord. So cervical myelopathy means dysfunction of the spinal cord, which is throwing your balance off typically, and that comes from pinching of your spinal cord in your neck, which is cervical stenosis. So they're all related. So basically, how do you know if you have it? The other, the first thing is your balance being thrown off. And also when the doctor checks you, he can get hyperreflexia in your legs, which means your reflexes are jumpy. So when he goes to hit your knee, your patella reflex, you may have a really jumpy reflex and kick him or her. The uh, You can also get clonus in your feet, these extra beats in your ankles when they check your ankles, and you can get other signs that show hyperreflexia. Your spinal cord dampens the reflexes in your legs. If your spinal cord isn't working, working well, then you get jumpiness of the reflexes in your legs. That's hyperreflexia. It's due to the spinal cord being compressed in your neck. It can also be from the spinal cord being compressed in your thoracic spine, which is around your rib cage. But your rib cage provides so much stability that usually the spinal cord doesn't get pinched there at your thoracic spine. Usually it's up in your neck where all the motion is occurring. Down in your lumbar spine, below your rib cage, those are the individual nerve roots. Your spinal cord ends at your rib cage. So usually problems down there don't affect the spinal cord. So back to the cervical myelopathy. The other thing it can present is in your upper extremities, in your arms, you can get clumsiness of your fingers. You can have difficulty doing buttons. And you can have slow, rapid hand motion. When you ha- when the doctor asks you to do your fingers real fast, up and down, up and down, up and down, you can't do it because they're clumsy and they're slow. That can be an evidence of upper extremity myelopathy, which usually entails the spinal cord being compressed at the C4 vertebral body or above, which is pretty rare. Usually the spinal cord gets compressed around C4, C5, and below, usually between C4 and C7, because that's where most of the motion occurs, so that's most to where the wear and tear occurs and where the spinal cord is going to get compressed. So the findings we look for, again, are the balance being off and then clumsiness of your hands are the most typical. So whether you should have surgery or not. So then a lot of times the doctor will get an MRI and will see how compressed is the spinal cord. Now, I see some patients that have compression of their spinal cord, but their exam is normal. Their balance is normal. Their hand function is normal. And so then it comes down to that's a tough decision. Should you have surgery to protect the spinal cord, even though it's working totally normal? And a lot of times if the spinal cord compression is not that bad, I will not recommend surgery because the risks of the surgery can outweigh the risk of having a spinal cord injury without surgery. So it comes down to what are the risks of the surgery? What's the risk without having surgery? And yes, people can fall and hit their head, get in a car accident, and because the spinal cord is compromised because of the stenosis and the pressure on it, it puts them at higher risk of having a spinal cord injury and paralysis without the surgery, but there's also risks of the surgery. And if I feel like the risks of the surgery are greater than the chance of having an issue without the surgery, it may not be worth doing the surgery. So that's kind of how we determine whether to do the surgery or not. Now, assuming somebody has significant spinal cord compression and maybe some findings on their exam that indicate the spinal cord is being compromised and the the function is being affected, there's two basic ways we can do the surgery. We can either go from the front or the back. Going in the front is pretty minimally invasive. We don't cut any muscle. We go in from the front, your, your discs 
sit right below your throat. So just below your throat is where your spine sits. And typically, if you go in the front, it's because the discs are pushing back on the spinal cord. The degeneration of the discs causes bone spurs to push back and flatten the spinal cord. If we go in the front, we can take the discs out directly under the microscope, take all the pressure off the spinal cord. And then we put in spacers, typically plastic spacers, bone or metal spacers, into the disc space to jack, keep the disc jacked open and then put a plate on the front to fuse it. So going in the front, for in my hands, almost always entails a fusion. Sometimes a simple discectomy at multiple levels. Sometimes it's a corpectomy where we take the whole vertebra out. Either way, it's the same basic surgery. The benefit of going in the front is not much dissection of the muscles, and we're able to directly take the pressure off the spinal cord, and we're able to restore the alignment. You know, when the discs degenerate, they collapse down on the front, so everybody gets more and more bent forward. We call that kyphosis, more and more like the hunchback in Notre Dame, more and more bent forward and crumpled over. Well, when we fuse somebody, we want to jack those discs back open in order to restore the height and the alignment and get your head back over the rest of your body so it weighs less and have less pain, and the fusion allows us to do that. But what's the downside to the fusion? Well, one thing is how many levels do we need to fuse? One or two level fusions, very straightforward. We do those on professional athletes. They can go back and play sports afterwards a lot of times. But if you have to fuse three or four levels from the front, that means we have to retract the throat over a greater period of time and over a longer distance is going to increase the risk of having swallowing issues, discomfort, and we call it dysphagia. The chance of having swallowing issues in an older person after you fuse three or four levels gets up to be 10 to 20 percent and that obviously is a significant complication also anytime we try and fuse the spine sometimes the bone doesn't grow you know fusion means we literally want the two vertebrae to fuse together we want them to grow together well sometimes the bone doesn't grow so you can have a failed fusion or a non-union and the chance of that can be up to 20 to 30 percent which can result in pain in which case we may have to go in the back to add screws and rods in the back to, to lock it down in the back. So an anterior fusion is very straightforward that's done all over the world, you know, all the time, hundreds of them, probably a week all over the world. Very straightforward surgery, but there's always a trade-off. So one of the other options is to go in the back and do the surgery in the back. And there's two basic options in the back. You can do a laminectomy or a laminoplasty. Now the laminectomy, the lamina is the arches of bone in the back and removing the lamina is a laminectomy. Anytime you say ectomy, it means take it out. So laminectomy means take out the lamina, which decompresses the cord. So you've got the stenosis because all the ligaments and the joints have buckled in or causing pressure on the spinal cord. If you take the roof off, if you take the lamina off with the laminectomy, you can take the pressure off the spinal cord, which is a surgery been around for 50 years. Well, the downside of that is you have removed some of these posterior structures that are providing stability. So what do you think can happen if you take the back off Well, the person can fall forward. So that kyphosis where the head has fallen forward, that can get worse after a laminectomy because we've removed the supporting structures. The incidence of kyphosis falling forward after a laminectomy gets up to be around 30%, which one in three, well, that's a big number. That's too high for my practice. So I don't do laminectomies on patients because a 30% complication of falling forward is just too significant. So one of the other options is to do a laminectomy and a fusion. You can go in the back, take the whole lamin off, and then put in screws and rods and fuse it. But one of the downsides of fusing it in the back is, again, that risk of a failed fusion. Maybe the bone won't grow. And the other part is if you do a fusion in the back, you stop all the motion, it can put more stress on the other discs and joints above and below the fusion, which can accelerate the wear and tear at those levels. So a a nice alternative in the back is called a laminoplasty. Now, plasty means change the shape. So laminoplasty means change the shape of the lamina. And basically what we do is we drill the lamina all the way through on one side, halfway through on the other side, and then we crack the bone open and put little metal plates in to create a gap in the lamina, which changes the shape in the lamina to open it up. 
And by opening up the shape of the lamina, it creates more room for the spinal cord. So one of the benefits of that procedure is we don't really have to touch the spinal cord or work on the spinal cord. We're just changing the shape of the bones around the spinal cord to make more room. And so it can be a very safe surgery. There's obviously always a risk. There's a risk with any of these surgeries, risk of paralysis, swallowing issues, infection, stroke, heart attack, death from any surgery. The risk of the laminoplasty by creating more room for the spinal cord, sometimes that change in environment, change in position can stretch the nerves, stretch the spinal cord, or cause an interruption of the blood supply like a stroke, which can result in a neurologic injury like weakness or paralysis. That can happen any with any of these surgeries we're talking about, going in the front, going in the back. Anytime you operate around the spine, there's always a risk of that. But overall, all of these surgeries are very safe because you're basically taking the pressure off the spinal cord and the nerves. And typically, we don't actually have to move the nerves out of the way because we're just making more room around the nerves and around the spinal cord. So the laminoplasty is nice because it preserves motion. We're not doing a fusion. We're not bridging across motion segments. We're not bridging across the joints or the discs. We're just changing the bone at each individual level. So it preserves motion. Now, you can lose some motion after laminoplasty. It's been reported up to even 30% of loss of motion, but the benefit of that is you're saving 70% of the motion. Whereas with the fusion, you're losing 100% of the motion because that's the purpose. You're locking it all in place. So the laminoplasty preserves motion, which is good for function. It also can put less stress on the other levels that you're not operating on because you're not transferring the stress to the other levels like you do after a fusion. The other part is we're still preserving this posterior bony arch so the muscles can fall back down and reattach to the bone, which can preserve better muscle function. Now, so all of it, now one other risk of the laminoplasty, we are changing some of that bony structure in the back and some of the muscle attachment. So there is a risk that you can fall into kyphosis and fall forward, but the risk of that is more around 5, maybe 10% as compared to the laminectomy, is around 30%. So it's significantly less risk of falling forward. So all three of these surgeries, the fusion from the front, going in from the back, the laminectomy or the laminectomy infusion, and then the third one is the laminoplasty, all of these options are good surgeries. They're done all over the world with good success rate. And part of it is just dealer's choice, whatever, whatever the surgeon is comfortable doing. In our practice, we try and really focus on what's the patient's pathology. And wherever the pathology is coming from, we want to work around that. And basically, if a lot of the pathology is from the front, then we may do a fusion from the front. Or if they've fallen forward where we want to open it up in the front, well, then we'll do the fusion because that can restore the alignment. But if they got pretty good alignment and a lot of the compression is coming from both the front and the back, if we can just go in the back and do the laminoplasty and open it up and preserve the motion and not do a fusion, then we'll do the laminoplasty. So these surgeries post-operative, what does it look like after the surgery? Most of these surgeries, people stay in the hospital for one or two nights. A lot of people are ready to go home the next day. One of the nice things about neck surgery is you can get up and move right away. It doesn't inhibit everything from your neck down. So your trunk and your legs, you can get up and walk right away and be very independent very shortly. The pain that people have from the surgery, uh, the fusions from the front usually don't hurt that bad. Usually people have swallowing issues that last for several days. Going in the back, people tend to have more pain. That's one of the benefits of doing the fusion from the front versus the laminoplasty is the fusion from the front addresses the pain from those degenerated segments. The laminoplasty, it doesn't because you're preserving motion. And you can have pain from the muscle dissection in the back, which is more extensive. So people after laminoplasty can have up to 20 20 to 30 percent of pain as compared to the fusions. So after the surgery, people go home after one or two nights. They usually need help around the house for two weeks, plan on no driving for two weeks, and then we see them two weeks after the surgery. We see how things look. We generally start physical therapy around six weeks after the surgery. Well, then you work on your core stabilization, your back stabilization exercises, and your chest out posture exercises. Our whole rehab program is in the Back Doctor app, which is in the App Store. And we obviously do that with the guidance of a physical therapist. We want to train professional to teach the patient how to do the exercises and to tailor the exercises to each specific person because everybody's muscle balance and posture is a little bit different. 
Generally, most people are back to pretty normal function by three months after the surgery, but it can take up to six months, even a year, to fully regain all the function. Spinal cord recovery and nerve recovery can take up to 18 months, which is good. It means there's a lot of potential to heal and to recover. The surgery for the spinal cord compression has been pretty reliably shown to stop the neurologic deterioration. So if you're losing your balance and losing control of your hands, having the surgery can preserve the function that you have left, and it can also help the spinal cord recover where you can actually get some of the function back. How much function you're going to get back is unpredictable, but at least the surgery can reliably stop it from getting worse and preserve what you got. So they're both good surgeries. Obviously, there's risk with any surgeries. Consult with your physician as to whether to do it or not. But they're both uh, done on a common basis every day all over the world and can really help people preserve a pretty basic human function, such as your ability to walk and your balance and the preservation of function of your hands, ability to use your hands. If you have any questions, please reach out anytime. We're at WatkinsSpine.com.